started. Um, Paul, firstly, I just want to say on behalf of Dumbo Feather, thank you so much for, for coming out. We've, um, you know, I think we've had workshops on these speaker series and, and the kind of people that we want to interview and you've always been at the top of our list. So we're just so thrilled to have you. And, um, and just personally to be interviewing you, I'm without sounding like some weird fanboy. <laughs> uh, I'm just really honored to, um, to be here with you. Um, <laughs> um, I actually, actually have met you before at, um, at Drum Keen when I was about eight years old. My parents took me up there. So, uh, so that, was, that was one of the highlights of my childhood meeting you. And so thank you for your stories and personally for getting me interested in reading and for making me feel that it was okay to be this awkward boy who doesn't like to play sports. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, I was trying to think of some, some kind of Paul Jennings stories from, from my childhood and, and I remember when I was about eight or ten years old, I arranged for our, um, the kids in my neighbourhood were going to put on a backyard production of the short story Moonies. Um, which I thought was, was a pretty exciting story. So um, my dad went to work and photocopied the story for each of us, which I probably realised is plagiarism or something, so some <laughs> little copyright, so <laughs> please don't, don't sue my dad. And, uh, and so the main, the main actress was one of our neighbours who was, who was a girl. Um, I think the, the lead character in the story is a boy. And when, the, um, when her mum found out that she was going to do the Mooney, she kind of came up to us and the whole, the whole play was going to be cancelled. And, and at, at a, at a, um, as a child, I couldn't understand why she would have a problem with her daughter just doing a Mooney, but, but now as an adult, I probably understand why that could be that awkward. And so then we arranged to have her do the Mooney in her bathers, but her mum still wasn't happy, and so the, so the play got cancelled, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a sad story. But... Um, but enough about you, I guess the, the first question... <laughs> um, awkward. So I wanted to start at the beginning. I'm not sure how many people are, are kind of aware of your story and your childhood and, and where you grew up and then coming to Australia. So, so I really want to ask, what was it like being Paul Jennings at, you know, 8, 10, 15? Oh, right. Well, thank you. Uh, the, the Mooney story never made it onto the television either. It was, uh, <laughs> um, well, I guess, uh, yes, I came out from England uh, in 1949, age six, and I do remember it quite well. Uh, when, I, when we left England, uh, my favourite book was the Rupert Bear books. Rupert was a little bear and he used to go off and have adventures and he'd see mermaids and... Arabs on camels and mad scientists and he'd always come home at night and Mother Bear would say, what happened? He'd say nothing, but he had this fantastic time. So when I heard we were coming to Australia, I knew it was going to be like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when we got off at Princess Pier, I was so disappointed. It was, <laughs> it was just like uh, England had been. And I do remember and a little event on the ship actually. They had a dress up party as we went through the Suez Canal and the children were all to come into the room where the dress up party was on and uh, the, the, everybody would clap and the one that got the loudest clap would win. And, the, and uh, so people were dressing their children up as pirates and ghosts and all sorts of things. I, I wanted to be a pirate and instead my parents hung these uh, labels on my sister and I, wrote on them, and I thought, this is no good, you know. <laughs> What's all this about? I really wanted to be a pirate, and we just walked in with labels hanging on. <laughs> I was very disappointed, my parents. Anyway, when we walked in, we got enormous uh, applause, and we won. And I uh, found out later, my parents explained it to me, that uh, this was of course, not long after the war in England, and they had dressed me up as, or as England, and they put labels Australia for my sister, and mine said uh, rationing, no petrol, coal, and wet, <laughs> and uh, she had two inch stakes, you know, plenty of petrol, no rationing, good housing, sunshine, and so on. And, uh, I, I, 
although I was disappointed we didn't win then, of course, my dream as Rupert came true and, of course, the migrants on the ship all applauded because that's why they were coming here on boats, I might say. <laughs> um, I, I read a quote, um, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember where it was from, but you said, um, when I look at photos of myself as a boy, um, they were, they were in, in, invariably this sad little boy looking out at the world in a rather confused, confused way. So what was, what, what was that all about and how, <laughs> you know, how, how was it growing up in, in Australia? I, I remember you saying about, you know, about your accent and, and you tried to quickly change that and everything. Yes, well, you don't want to be different when you were young and uh, so I was a little, I was the only little uh, English boy at the school. My sister was the only other English person there and yeah. we had a little English accent and you got teased for it and I lost mine like that. Like, <laughs> and, uh, my mother was very disappointed. She said, oh, you sound so common now. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, it was hard and she, my mother uh, was sad. I, even though it was a dream for them to come here, she really missed all her family in England and her mother and her sister and uh, her mother was to come with us, my grandma, and uh, the day before we would leave she had a dream that she'd die on the boat. So she said she wouldn't come and uh, so she had to be found other accommodation and uh, they came six months later on a subsequent boat which we came on and my mother was very sad she wasn't there but I've often reflected she probably over 80, may have died spiritually sort of to have left her at homeland at that time. And your parents' sadness sort of passes to you as a child too, I think, and you sort of possibly feel a little bit responsible to make them happy. Um, and, and I think when you, were, when you were a young teenager, you submitted a story to Woman's Weekly. Um, could you could you tell me a little bit about about that story? Yes, well, that was uh, perhaps the beginning or the end of my writing career. I uh, I, uh, I, I did want to write, and uh, it was the only thing I ever thought I was perhaps might be good at. And uh, so, my friend and I, his name was Robert Fox. We went for a camping on our bikes from Rabin where we lived. We rode up to Eldon Weir, which is quite a long way. You wouldn't be allowed to do it around about 14 or 15 these days probably, but we camped out in the bush next to the Goulburn River and had a little tent with no sand in floor, of course. And uh, there we were alone in the bush and uh, I went outside the tent to do something and I saw there coiled up a tiger snake and I was terrified so I ran back in and I was there, Foxy, Foxy, there's a tiger snake outside the tent. I said, what was that? <laughs> and so we got our sleeping bags and put them in the middle and we sat back to back uh, <laughs> and we shone the torch around the edge of the <laughs> tent waiting to you know, see if this tiger snake was going to come in. Anyway, uh, the torch of course was fading and fading and finally the batteries were run out and we're sitting there in the dark. <laughs> And uh, I'm sitting there with my hands like this, with our backs together, and uh, suddenly I said, uh, Hey, Foxy, he said, What? I said, There's something cold and wet going across my hand. I said, oh, I said, you know, so I said, Strike a match. So he struck a match, and there on my hand was this huge bullfrog. <laughs> <laughs> so, we screamed and jumped on our bikes and we rode <laughs> and rode till we came to a little shop and we sat outside that all night. And when I got home I thought, uh, that's a good story, I'm going to write it up. So I wrote it up in an exercise book in pencil and uh, I sent it to a well-known magazine which my mother had called Woman's Weekly <laughs> and said, uh, would you publish this story? And I got a nice letter back saying, dear Mr. Jennings, uh, we're not going to publish it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm no good. Um, I was really hurt. And of course, when you send out your story, 
it's like sending out your love and if you don't get a response, well, it's, it's hurtful. So uh, I didn't write again until I was nearly 40. And um, so uh, but it had one nice little ending. Uh, I wrote a series of books with Morris Gleitzman called Wicked and um, one day I got a letter saying, could we publish the first chapter in Women's Weekly? <laughs> 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 So that, I guess that rejection that you had when you were so young and, and that obviously had such a profound impact on you and you didn't write for you know, 20, 25 years later. What, I guess what were the expectations that you had on yourself as a 14 year old um, that that kind of rejection would have, would have such, an, such an impact? Yes, well, you know, I guess I didn't really think I was anything very uh, good at things at school except writing and I remember once we, we had a thing at school where you had to write a, a, a story, a composition really, or, no it was a piece of fiction. So I remember writing a story about some racing cars and we had, so the teacher didn't have to read them all, you swapped with the kid next year and he read it and he said to me, you pinched that out of a book. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it must have been good if he thought I pinched it <laughs> out of a book. But you do need encouragement. And uh, I, I think, you know, I remember getting the cane at school for hiding in the library when football was on. <laughs> and, uh, wow. and I think that probably the, the, the lesson I would learn from it is really that we need to be really careful in our schools to spot the children with talents in certain areas and uh, problems or things they don't like in other areas and really see if we can encourage them in the, in the area, whether it be football or ballet or whatever it is to say, just because there's, there's a little bit of a problem, I think, some, with some of the testing and that they do now, that they don't allow for children to follow their dreams perhaps as much yeah. as we could. Mm. And what do you think you would say to your 14-year-old self? Would you be like, it's going to be okay because in, in 30 years' time, I'm going to be pretty awesome? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, because the book which, uh, which I, I've I'm just been doing the rounds uh, with at the moment, Don't Look Now, which is my latest book, which Andrew Weldon has illustrated, that... Uh, when I think about that, it's about a boy who wants to fly and I'm struck by how many people have told me I wanted to fly when I was a kid. I was really want, wanted to fly and why I wanted to fly was not to be up there with the birds and not looking at the view. It was so all the kids would look up and say, look at Janice, you know, he, he's flying. So I wanted to be famous and, uh, and, and uh, so in, this, in the book that I've written uh, with Andrew, the boy can fly, he finds out he can fly through various ways, but if anyone sees him, he'll fall to the ground and die. And he can't get off the ground if, the, if, if somebody's watching, and including animals, like if a dog sees him, down he'll go. And uh, in, this, in this series of books, Andrew's done a picture in each story of him imagining he's famous. Yeah. And I did get famous in a way, you know, a limited sort of, you know, I mean, it's, it's really lovely when people want your autograph. I remember the first time I did an autograph was when my first book came out. I'm segueing a bit here, I have to get back to the point, but a little girl came out <coughs> of the school. I was with my daughter who was 15 and she wanted me to sign my autograph on piece of toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter said you blushed that and uh, I did but, but then uh, the story as the story goes at the end of it the boy he learns that fame is not everything and that there are more important things than fame 
he does get his reward. He's after a girl all the way through it. He's trying to impress her. And, uh, the girl from the car wash. <laughs> the girl from the Uvinda book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I have reflected, uh, you know, there's always, when you write, after you finish, you always realise there's some of me in there, uh, you know, that I didn't know I was writing about. And I think for a while I did handle the fame thing badly. Most people who do achieve a certain degree of have been known to do, do that. So to a certain extent I unconsciously wrote my own story. So I would say to that boy, if it happens, don't get a big head over it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess just, you yeah, touched on it before, but about the, the continuous themes that, that I guess come up in a lot of your stories and, and even these books about, about Ricky, about the kind of the, the misfits and the weirdos and the people that, that don't really fit in, whether it's the kids or whether it's the whole kind of twist family in, in Round the Twist, is that, has that been a conscious thing or that's just, that's just kind of come up? Yes, well I guess it does reflect how I did feel as I was growing up, but I often reflect that most, most kids do feel that, like even the bullies don't sit there thinking I'm a bully, they, you know, they're struggling with all, <laughs> all sorts of, of problems, but it does. Re you, me you mentioned around the twist. Well, I wrote that shortly after becoming a single parent, and I had four children that I was the, the carer for, and it was reflected in my writing. Um, people often ask me why there's so many single parent families in your stories. It's partly because it's biographical, but autobiographical. But it's also partly because. I'm very plot orientated. I want to get on with it, and I don't want too many people unless I need it. <laughs> uh, but having said that, you know, the Around the Twist TV series was based on my family. So Linda, who was the girl in it, I have daughter Linda, and Bronson was a little boy, and uh, was a single father, and he goes down to uh, southwest Victoria, and he, He's hoping to meet a woman, so that was in the story too. And I always say the boy in the story is always me, but yeah. I, I, I think the dad in the story was me too. And that so, so. Mm -hmm. so you wrote Unreal, which was your first published book in, in your late 30s, is that, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I guess at, at Dumbo Feather, you know, we always talk about the kind of people we interview are people that are living a life with passion and purpose and meaning. Did you feel that you were living that life up until then um, with your kind of other jobs and your other career or did you always feel that there was something else inside you and, and you hadn't quite reached your full purpose or, or, or passions yet? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question that um, because I, I think I always felt passionate about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. My father told me you can't do your matriculation, which is VCE, because my best friend failed it. He was a year ahead of me. He said, if he can't pass it, you can't pass it. <laughs> so I went to Teachers College, which you could go to after year 11 in those days. You didn't even have to do your VCE. And when I was leaving, after we graduated from the two year course, I was 19, my English lecturer was a was a lovely man, very intelligent, but he said to me, uh, he, he found out that I was going to teach a class of uh, intellectually challenged children, and he said to me, don't waste your talent on them. And uh, I, I respected him a lot, but I knew it was wrong, and that I, I really, I think I was passionate about doing that, and I really wanted to do it. And so I, I taught in that area for quite a while and then I became a speech therapist. I think I was passionate about that. And then I became a lecturer, teaching, uh, training teachers of disabled children. But something was gnawing away there and I, th I do think that my thing is writing and, uh, and so I guess it's like the midlife crisis really in a way. I, <laughs> I finally had a go and, and what happened was I being the so-called expert on reading disabilities and lecturing in that a lot, um, I had one of my own, uh, I had a, a child I was working with who had a reading problem and 
he was uh, reading his little book next to the fireplace and he suddenly got tears in his eyes and he chucked it across the room. He said, I hate these piddly little books. <laughs> and uh, I read this story, I thought, that's really weak. And I felt ashamed I'd given it to him, really. And so I thought, I, can, I think I could write a better story than that. So I wrote a couple of stories, including Skeleton on the Dunny. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I sent them to six publishers, and uh, the fourth one was Penguin Books, and uh, they said, oh, we quite like, they sent me a letter, we quite like these stories. I've got this in Warrnambool, why don't you come and see us sometime? So I raced over the phone and said, what about tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I went down to see them. I was very nervous. like. I've been lecturing and I've written academic stuff, but to write your fiction, you're really nervous about it. Your soul's coming out of it, even if it's skeleton on the dunny. And, uh, <laughs> so it was a boiling hot day and my car didn't have any, any cooling or anything in it. It was a beat up old car. So I thought, I'll just wear my old daggy shorts and thongs and I'll stop in the park near Penguin and get into some decent clothes and then I'll go to the interview with these people who, who read my manuscript. But when I pulled up at the park, I'd forgotten my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went in and I got a daggy old painty uh, shorts and they were very nice, and <laughs> three ladies, uh, uh, they were very nice, and uh, I remember going home and saying, they were all lovely, I really liked the English one, and uh, she became my editor for nearly 30 years, and um, uh, while I was there, the secretary came in and she said to, to one of them, Donald Horn's on the phone for you. And uh, she said, tell him, I'll call him back, I'm with an author. I went, oh, this is wild. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was me. So I, I, I think that that passion, you know, when the book came out, I'd carry it around. And every now and then I'd get it out and say, oh, I wrote that, you know. <laughs> like, but, uh, <laughs> So I think I was passionate about the other things, but I, I do believe perhaps we have things that get squashed in us uh, through circumstances, uh, maybe schools, parents, or our own fears that could be lying there that you can find. Uh, and in my case, I was lucky it came out. So that's why I answered your question. <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> um, I, I guess I want to talk next a bit about being published and, you know, your beginnings and, and where you are now and that balance between what you want to write and what the publishers think is in the, the best interest. Is that, has that been a struggle and is that still a struggle or do you have, I'm sure you have a bit more of a say now? <laughs> yes, well, I, I guess there is, I mean, I, I was lucky, I've had fantastic editors, um, um, I had a number of editors at Penguin, besides Julie, who I just mentioned before. I think Catherine's here tonight some, somewhere. Who's, uh, and there she's up the back. And uh, <laughs> your editor is on your side. They want your book to be good. Yeah. And I've got, had lots of stuff go in the bin because Catherine or Julie told me that it was uh, no good. Mm -hmm. But I guess there is a little pressure to keep doing, perhaps from the powers that be in the big publishing houses, to keep, they would like you to keep doing what you always do, mm -hmm. and they don't want you to do something different. And I can remember when I was writing the TV show Round the Twist, which you mentioned before, uh, they, they said to me, would you write some publicity stuff for us? Because with a television show, you had to get some money from Europe and from America and from Australia, and then when you get that, they'll go ahead and make it. So 
they wanted to get people to put money into it. So they said, write some stuff, Paul, you know, that will make people put their money in it. So I wrote, there's never been anything like this before. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a phone call, no, 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 you cannot say that, you know. <laughs> say that it's like halfway between Home Alone and Edward Scissorhands or something, but <laughs> you, you can't say there's nothing like that before. And so there is a little pressure that you would keep on writing the same thing. And I wrote 10 collections of funny short stories and, and then I thought the world doesn't need any more of those. Okay. <laughs> um, you, you just mentioned then about the, the pressures of writing what you, you always write and, and I think in the Dumbo Feather interview you had just released or you were about to release um, The Nest which you were um, working on for four years and, and the target audience is you know, 15 plus and it's a, a psychological thriller very different to, to what you were known for. W what was the reaction to that, either you know, the public reaction also your, your personal reaction getting to publish such a different book? Yes, well, I, I think there were, I, in retrospect, I would have made that an adult book, I think. Um, it was about a boy with obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, I think it's my best book, but it's probably my smallest selling book. Uh, so it, from the publisher's point of view, it's probably not a great success. And, uh, but I'm really glad I wrote it. And, uh, and I think at this stage of my life, I, I do feel, you know, that I, I want to write things that I'm, it's really grabbing me and that I'm, I want to say and not to be so concerned about how they sell, but you can't help it really. I mean, I was confessing to Marianne the other day that I took a sneak at the bestseller list, you know, like, you shouldn't really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really interested about the, um, the covers of your books, because I was going through my collection, I have, um, such vivid memories of me just staring at the covers for you know hours and looking at all the little secret messages, um, and then I was looking online and all the all the books that I remember. I think they'll buy. Is it Keith McEwen? McGowan, yes, Keith McEwen. Twitter? And and most of your books, like you know, all the Unreal um, series, have been re-illustrated, you know, two or three times. And I see a new copy of the book, and it's got these stories that I love, but this cover that I don't really. Um, um, affiliate with, and I'm like, oh, it's not you know that amazing cover that I remember. How how precious are you about that? Because I'm you know you're obviously aware of having to update the illustration style to to what would appeal to kids at, at that time. Yes, well, I certainly understand your position because I exactly feel like that if I <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I I do understand that, but yes, the fashions do change. I mean, my first book was published. 1985, and when you think what was around 85, there were no mobiles and um, not computers really, and, and it was a totally different world that the children live in. Uh, so, uh, but there were also fashions with the books, like that first copy of Unreal was very thin. I remember being told it was the paper was called the toilet paper <laughs> by the publisher because it was the cheapest, mm -hmm. and uh, my name was so small you could hardly read it because no one's heard of you, of course, <laughs> and the, the, the title's big. And I wanted it to look like adult novels for the, because I was after the reluctant readers, and I wanted it to look like a sophisticated book, so it had close type, small type, not much white around it. And uh, that was the in thing for the kids then to have a, you know, you're not in the bubs anymore with the pictures, but you, you've got this really sophisticated book. And that's all different now. It's like, there's plenty of white space. Everybody wants white space now and much bigger and um, all the color and everything. So, the, you know, there's a trend to keep bringing them out differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> um, and I, I was looking at the covers and I noticed that, um, that most of the covers have males on the front cover um, and, and not females. Has that been a conscious decision? Because I'm aware that, you know, you're, <laughs> um, 
you know, you've wanted to increase um, literacy rates, um, and, and that's been part of your plight, and that's been, you know, about the book that, that you wrote a, f a few years ago about parents t teaching their children to read. And has that been a conscious decision to um, get boys to read? So now I know why you wouldn't give me a list of the questions first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that's a tough one. Well, the, the thing about, uh, should there be more stories about girls, because there's probably, you're right, I, I guess it'd be 90% of the stories have a male lead in it, and the ma males feature on the cover more. But I used to say to my friend Robin Klein, you all got 90% girls, <laughs> and, uh, and then I do have a little excuse, I was a boy and I wasn't mm -hmm. a girl. Uh, <laughs> And I have got some, I have got some covers with a girl on it, but mm -hmm. most of them are boys. Uh, this is sad but true, and it's, by the way, the, the author doesn't have a lot of power over the cover. You, mm. you do get a say, but you don't always get what you want. Mm -hmm. But it is true that I think, in general, the girls will, no, I don't think I want to say this, actually. But, uh. Okay. Are you going to say that, um, and, and what I was thinking, that um, girls would read a book with a boy on the front cover, but boys generally wouldn't want to read a, a book with a girl on the cover? I, I can... You said that. Okay, I said that. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll finish up in a moment, because I'm sure a lot of you have a million questions. I just want to ask um, one, one more question that, I, that the 11 year old um, inside of me wants to ask. I was, I was reading that there's a script somewhere of the gizmo, the movie. Can you oh, confirm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm amazed that you know that. Okay. Mm. I'm doing my research. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did write one, um, and it, it didn't get up. Uh, script writing. Is a, uh, you know, the, the thing, I guess I, if I write a book, I'm pretty sure it will get published. Um, you know, I know it's a reasonable story and, and uh, you know, it'll, a very good chance it will get published. But if you write a movie, uh, you don't know that. Like, yeah. there's a lot of money, millions of millions of dollars going to it, it's a big risk. Mm -hmm. And so I did, I did, uh, I was approached by a, a producer and I did write a script for that, but mm -hmm. he, he couldn't get it up, mm -hmm. so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's an in-movie term. <laughs> yeah. Well, on, on that note, um, <laughs> that could be, that could be, that could be your next, your next story. I'm sure the kids yeah. would appreciate that story. Um, so let's, let's open it up to the audience. Um, first question over here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, yeah, I always really loved your books growing up and grew up to be a storyteller myself, turning my newspaper reporter, and I vividly remember my dad begging, begging, making my dad take me to Lighthouse to play Linda. So <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That's, that's lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had a lot of um, children name their cat Singin' Poo? I'm sure you've had. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, actually. I think the parents might have a bit of a say in it. Okay. <laughs> Anyone out there about to get a cat? I think that would be an awesome <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Um, do you have an inner critic? And how do you manage it? Does it come about in like, real life? Yes. Uh, and that's an interesting question. I, I throw a lot of material out, and so I guess that means I have got an inner critic as far as, as that goes. I usually know it's a good story by the time I've finished it. Um, sometimes one will go through the editor and they'll say that it's 
you know, that the whole thing's not good. That, that, that usually will be part of it. Um, but I, I th when I'm writing, especially if it's a funny one, I'll be laughing. Like, I think, oh, that's a great <laughs> gag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I'm laughing, I think the children would likely to be laughing too. So uh, it's a very difficult... The process that I do is... Um, I've got an ideas book. I'll start jotting down ideas and... Uh, most of them won't make it. I think, no, that's a silly idea, that's a silly idea, or I might persevere with it for a little while. So I'm fairly strict about that outline of the story before I start. I'll look down, is that really good? And I try to do a surprise ending, and a surprise ending is really hard. And, you know, I've done about 100 short stories, so I always think, I will never think of another surprise <laughs> ending. And... Uh, they're, they're quite difficult to do, but I try to achieve that. So, um, when, when I was, before I actually wrote my first story, I, I went to uh, a short story writing class run by Carmel Bird, well known novelist, and uh, it was run by the uh, Adult Education Board or whatever. That, um, and it was the time when I was a single parent, actually. And my, uh, I said to my boss, I was doing a master's degree at the time, and I said, I, I can't finish this master's degree because I've look, got to look after the kids. I'm, and uh, he said, well, you'll be finished as a lecturer, Paul, if you don't finish your master's degree and go on and get a PhD. He said, but what, what else would you like to do? I said, I would like to write fiction. So he said, is there anywhere you can study that? So I, found this course in Melbourne and he said I'll give you a car it was the Warrnambool Institute of Advanced Education it's Deakin University now but when I was there it was the institute he said I'll give you a car and you can go down to that course in the works car which was very bold and generous of him and I later dedicated one of my books to him um, he said but if you don't get published you'll be finished you know and uh, <laughs> so anyway I went to Carmel's uh, course, and she said, uh, it was about short story writing, she, she said, you know, you want people to uh, exclaim at the end, go, uh, she said, the minimum is aha, that's the minimum you can get is aha. Mm -hmm. If you can get, wow, you trick me, that's, you know, that's <laughs> really good. And I think I've, to answer your question, always, my inner critic has said, yeah, is the aha there at least, you know, and uh, I hope that would be answered be yes. One little story that happened, uh, which on that course was uh, Carmel told everyone in the class the first day to write a story and hand it in and she'd tell us the next week. Uh, and uh, the next week I went back and I was very nervous thought, you know, this is my first go at writing fiction. And she said to the class, I'm going to read one out, it's really good. And I thought, let it nine, let it nine. <laughs> anyway, it was. <laughs> and, uh, that was nice. And then she gave it to me and there were little ticks and things. And uh, one of the paragraphs she'd written, you can't say this. And I took it home, I looked at it. I went over it, I couldn't see anything wrong with it. I was thinking, have I changed tense? Have I split infinitives? What have I done? You know, I read it. And I, anyway, I couldn't figure out anything was wrong with it. And many years later, of at the Byron Bay Writers Festival, I was on a panel with her. So I thought, I'm going to find that story. <laughs> <laughs> so I dug it out and I read it, and I saw to my horror that because I was pretty naive in those days when I wrote that. I, I had written the sentence, the car jerked off. Much cleaner, much nicer, much easier. I just wonder 
publishers or you know just what what your opinion is about the kind of stuff that's coming out now that is well I'm, but I'm, I don't actually read the other people's things because um, <laughs> you've got two, two choices. You know, one is you can think, well, that's no good and it's, it's really hard to make that call because you like your own material. So, and, and the other one is that it's really good and you're filled with envy. So <laughs> I, I honestly don't read very much at all. Um, I do think there are changes that have happened and I think we all have to be a bit slicker and a bit faster, you know, uh, because of the way that the, that the iPads and so on and the, and the television is so quick now and it, and it just moves so fast and there's so much uh, multimedia that they watch. Whereas an adult will give you maybe 30 pages before they don't like a book. The child might give you 30 words. They might only give you three lines before it. So the press is really on you to be quick and... Uh, but hopefully we can still maintain uh, some, in amongst all the humour and that, yes, there's darkness there. I think that's a great thing, don't get me wrong. I mean, I love it. I feel like um, it's a lot of, of the books that come out now are, are like, um, I don't know, I don't know if comes with the right word, but, you know, that they're, they're, they're all safe and easy and stuff and they don't expose kids to some of the real, you know, the sad and darker things that go on in them. I love it about books. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't believe that for primary school children you should present the world as a dark and evil place. I, I think that, um, you know, okay, when they're teenagers and they're starting to realise that there are dark things too, so, but I, I, I will put sad things and people die in the stories. I, I, I have one story about the little dog that was based on a true thing actually. At where I lived in Warrnambool, I had these um, big holes in the ground and the farmers would throw down a sheep or a cow if it was dead into these holes rather than bury it. And uh, I heard this on the news uh, down in Warrnambool and uh, the farmer was going past this hole one day, it was very, very deep and he hears a noise there and he listens and yip, yip, yip. Oh, I think there's a dog down this hole and so they got a big uh, tow truck with a uh, cable on it and put a seat on it and lowered this man right down the hole and uh, went down, 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 down. Sure enough, there was a little dog down there. He put the dog up his jumper and just see the little patch of light, went all the way up, put the little dog on the ground and the saddest thing was that the little dog could only walk around with its head back like this. Aww. And... Uh, it was obviously been down there for a long time looking up for someone to come and uh, so I thought I would write that into a story which obviously it's a very sad story and the little girl wrote me a letter and said uh, my mum was reading me that story in bed and she had tears in her eyes and, <laughs> and uh, I said what are you bawling for and she said shut up it's a bloody good story. <laughs> <laughs> and I did twist it around a little bit uh, so that the mean man fell down the hole and uh, the dog felt sorry for him and went and dropped bits of food and then for him to eat and a dead cat and so on. And so on. <laughs> then when he got out, of course, he was walking around like that. <laughs> and uh, So there's a little bit of darkness there but always a happy ending. Um, I think we've got time for about two more questions, so I think... I was going to say, probably time for a few more I just say, do you think there's a little bit of too much sort of political correctness in children's literature now, and there's not enough um, just storytelling and realness, rather than just giving children... Yeah, just too much political correctness, rather than just a good story? Well, it, it's a very difficult question. Uh, um, to, I don't like to be didactic, so I never really start out to teach a lesson. I just start to tell a story and from somewhere inside you this theme comes out and afterwards I'm very often surprised, oh, where did that come from? Um, but I never start with, 
I'm going to teach everyone to be polite to grandma or something, you know, they've got to uh, have a really good story, but I think because you're hopefully as a writer or a decent person that uh, the, va the values will come out there. But there are people, there are gatekeepers who can impose their own views on, on the books and there are a lot of very popular writers who perhaps don't win the awards but sell a lot of books and, you know, really, if you're writing a funny book, I always think, well, if the least you did was that some children lying in bed laughing, that's, that's pretty good, um, <laughs> it was good for me and then if more comes out of it, that's good too and hopefully it does. Mm. Just one more question. Um, just uh, listening to people talk around the room, it's funny how you produce a story and then they sort of become ours to become our own, you know, ownership of your stories. Can you just share one of your favourite bits of feedback? Like what, what stories have come back to you when you've given us your story? Well, I've had lots of uh, nice feedback from children and adults. I, I, I think one of my favourites was. Uh, little boy said, uh, all he said was, Dear Paul Jennings, <laughs> how, do you kn how do you know what it's like to be me? And uh, I thought, that's pretty nice. Um, and, and I suppose the, the answer really is that although we've got all these different things now and, and with the computers and the iPads and so on, uh, the way I felt my first day at school or getting off the boat at Princess Pier, whatever, that's, that the children still have the same feelings today and that's what the story's about. So, uh, but probably that's a nice little bit of <laughs> feedback. Um. <laughs> Beautiful, that's such a lovely, lovely little anecdote to end on. Um, on behalf of everyone, just thank you so much. We all, we all love you and we, we hope that you continue to write your stories for, for many, many years. So thank you.